Hello, hello and welcome back to CS500 Design and Analysis of Algorithms. Today, we're starting chapter 10 about memory efficient algorithms. And we see at the end of chapter 10, some very interesting connections between memory efficient algorithms and efficiently parallelizable algorithms. So stay tuned for this highlight of chapter 10. And with that said, let me start by sharing the screen. And now, with a survey about chapter 10, we begin with some motivation and some classification of memory efficient and memory aware algorithms. Then we will revisit some of our well-known algorithms for calculating Fibonacci numbers with increasing efficiency. Efficiency meaning runtime efficiency, but now we're going to review them from the perspective of how much memory they use and whether this increased uh, runtime performance comes at a cost of increased memory or not. Then we will <clears throat> look at the uh, uh, matrix powering. Remember, matrix powering was an important tool for devising not only efficient runtime efficient algorithms for Fibonacci numbers, but also for uh, parallelizing the graph reachability problem. And this time we look at matrix powering from the perspective of memory use and then recall what that means for memory efficient algorithms for graph reachability. This teaches us some lessons. These examples teaches us some lessons about methods of saving cost, uh, saving memory, and the cost that comes in general with saving memory, namely at the expense of uh, runtime. Here's the announced <clears throat> connection between memory efficient algorithms and uh, uh, efficient parallel algorithms. We'll talk about streaming algorithms and maybe or maybe not time permits to also uh, talk about IO efficient or external memory algorithms. So what is the motivation for focusing on memory efficiency where all in the past we focused on uh, runtime efficiency. Well, one reason is that time is unlimited, unbounded, but memory is limited. So if you run an algorithm, if you run a program on your computer, but there's not enough memory, then you will never get the result. Whereas if there's not enough time, all it takes is a little bit maybe more patience to get that result. And that's one reason why many modern PCs have this memory hierarchy, uh, more precisely have virtual memory where uh, the amount of memory is simulated um, by uh, extended to external memory such as hard disks or even tapes. But that doesn't help always, for example, a router processes, easily processes gigabytes, if not terabytes of data every single day. And there's no way to store that even uh, with external memory. So this, <clears throat> these are example applications where the memory limit is crucial. And actually my own research um, also gives such an application, namely, efficient algorithms for calculating with um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, continuous data with desirable output precision, where the input precision is not known in advance. And uh, some approaches to this end store the intermediate calculation symbolically, which results in very fast algorithms, but they very easily also run out of memory for storing the symbolic representations and therefore a memory efficient approach to calculating with arbitrary precision uh, like uh, Norbert Müller's IRAM 
is actually more practical with trading runtime for saving memory. Now I've previously, uh, previously already mentioned the memory hierarchy. So let's call the memory hierarchy. Knowing that memory is limited, time is unlimited. The hierarchy starts with CPU registers of which they are very few, um, maybe only a kilobyte roughly, um, <clears throat> but they're uh, almost immediately accessible to, to the arithmetic logical unit ALU in the CPU. On the other end of the spectrum, there's um, external memory dynamic RAM, which is uh, not inside the CPU, but connected on the motherboard, on the main board. Here, access times range from maybe 50 nanoseconds, as opposed to less one nanosecond for the CPU registers. So <clears throat> they're slower access, but the other hand, the size, the overall size of the memory here is one kilobyte roughly, whereas external memory that's easily in the size of gigabytes. Beyond both trading, um, <clears throat> running time efficiency for size are the caches, uh, level one caches common nowadays, whereas early processors like the Apple IIe or Commodore 64 um, did not need such cache. Level one caches may be in the size of uh, megabytes and some processors also have level two caches, which are larger but slower and maybe even occasionally a level three cache. At the other end of the spectrum, there's the external memory, such as hard disks, uh, solid state disks, or even magnetic disks. Here, uh, there's actual physical movement involved, right? So if you consider hard disk spinning at uh, maybe 7,000 revolutions per minute, then um, it takes quite some time in the magnitude of uh, uh, milliseconds or tenth of milliseconds for one revolutions to be completed and thus for in order to access the data. So that's a different order of magnitude. And but once the initial data item has been found on such a spinning disk, then the subsequent bytes follow on this track of the disk and can be accessed much more quickly. So here we have random access memory, and this is not really random access. And good memory efficient algorithms, memory aware algorithms make use of that and try to place the data that is accessed in sequence on sequential uh, sectors of such a, a disk. And even further, extending to uh, magnetic tapes that may take up to seconds or even minutes to uh, spin the tape, to rewind the tape to the desired position. And then once that rewind has finished, then it is relatively, but still fast, but still slower than a hard disk to access the subsequent items on that sequential tape. So this is the memory hierarchy and uh, memory aware algorithms make use of that and try to deliberately try to place frequently used data higher up the hierarchy and less frequently used data uh, lower down the hierarchy. But memory um, oblivious algorithms or ignorant algorithms leave it to the operating system where to place the data um, on this hierarchy. So that being said, with it motivation, let's now like look at Fibonacci algorithms that we considered already in undergraduate algorithm course, CS300 there, focusing mostly on runtime efficiency. And here we will recall these algorithms from two perspectives. First, we will count the number of operations performed by these algorithms and the number of variables stored by these algorithms as a kind of approximation, recall the purpose of algorithm is analysis to predict 
the actual behavior. But a more realistic and more accurate prediction will arise from switching from counting the number of operations and counting the number of variables towards considering how large are the data items processed in each operation and how many bits does it take to store each variable. So proceeding first to counting and then more accurately to bit measures. We start with a trivial algorithm, the recursive algorithm that simply mirrors the recursive definition of Fibonacci numbers. And as you may recall, um, from uh, Binet's formula, one can actually derive an explicit expression this for Fibonacci numbers. This explicit um, expression is not actually useful for calculating Fibonacci numbers because it involves irrational numbers. And uh, we will not discuss um, in this lecture how to actually store and process irrational numbers. That's uh, my actually actual research um, uh, topic. But it, uh, Binet's formula is very useful to get an estimate on the um, growth of magnitude of the Fibonacci numbers. Namely, they grow exponentially fast uh, with the base being the golden mean. And that means that the binary length of these Fibonacci numbers, since they are integers, grows linearly with the index. So that's an important lesson to learn here. And we'll return to that lesson when we switch from counting the number of operations and counting the number of variables to how many bits are processed in each operation and how many bits are stored in each variable. So first we count the number of operations and that uh, recursion, that recurrence um, is here. So in order to calculate the end Fibonacci number, there are two recursive calls and the running times for that add up. First recursive call, then the second recursive call, plus some constant overhead for managing all these cases. And this recurrence is basically the same as that for the Fibonacci numbers themselves, except that there's a plus O of one here, but essentially it's still asymptotic growth. And therefore the running time of that recursive algorithm is exponential, so it's very bad. Proceeding from this runtime analysis to memory analysis, we only basically need to change one thing, namely the memory used for the first recursive call can be reused when making, subsequently making the second recursive call so that the overall memory used by this recursive algorithm is not the sum that applies to the running time, but it's the maximum of the memory used by both recursive call, leading to the um, uh, aphorism that a memory can be reused, runtime cannot be reused, or mathematically speaking, the running time corresponds to an additive semi-group, whereas the memory use corresponds to the maximum uh, and its induced semi-group. Again, we have some overhead, constant overhead for storing intermediate results, and solving that recurrence leads to a linear use of memory. So that this is a linear memory algorithm, but recall that we here we have only counted the number of operations for its running time and counted the number of variables. For more uh, accurate prediction of the performance of this algorithm, we now refine this, take into account the magnitude of the integers that are being added here and that are being stored here. And to this end, we basically simply need to multiply both the counting running time and the counting memory use with O of n to obtain the bit running time and the bit memory use. So the bit running time is of course a little bit larger, but it's still only singly exponential. The bit use uh, are now n squared, multiply everything with O of n because the intermediate variable has n bits. 
So that this is a quadratic algorithm from the memory with the bit perspective. Let's do the same for the second algorithm, the iterative algorithm for calculating Fibonacci numbers. Um, this iterative algorithm you can see here. And here the running time analysis is uh, also easy because the algorithm basically makes a loop proceeding from the first two initial Fibonacci numbers up, always storing only the previous and the current Fibonacci number, adding them up to obtain the next Fibonacci number and the pre uh, current Fibonacci number then becomes the previous one. So that this loop is executed n times and the number of operations performed in each iteration in the loop body is constant, so that the running time here obviously is linear, counting the number of operations. And the number the type of operations here are assignment, assignment, integer addition, and decrement. Therefore, the number of variables stored in this algorithm is constant. There's the counter, and there's two or three intermediate variables for the next, the current, and the previous Fibonacci numbers. Again, this is the counting analysis, here indicated with the letter small t and small s for memory. Memory means uh, a space. In order to convert that into a bit complexity analysis, we basically simply need to multiply everything with big O of n, so because the number of bits stored in each variable, constantly many variables, n bits each, results in O of n bits. And also, the running time of each operation of assignment, that is basically copying, and of adding, adding n bit integers, copying n bit integers, costs O of n each. Therefore, multiplying this with n results in the capital, the bit running time being quadratic and the bit memory use becoming linear. So that means we have an improvement here from the recursive to the iterative al algorithm, both aspects in the running time and in the memory use. Let's now move on to the third algorithm that we considered in undergraduate CS300, Introduction to Algorithm. That algorithm was based on integer matrix powering. Namely, we realized that we can reformulate the recursion for Fibonacci numbers, the defining recurrence, as in this the form, because it's a linear recurrence, with this particular matrix, row times column here means adding the previous and the current Fibonacci number to get the next one, and the previous uh, Fibonacci number becomes the uh, current one here. And all expanding that recursive matrix uh, um, expression for k iterations means that the current Fibonacci number can be obtained from the initial one when k is equal to n minus 1, by multiplying the initial conditions 1 and 0 with the kth power of that integer 2 times 2 matrix, where k is equal to n minus 1. And that purely mathematical observation led us to an algorithm that calculates the nth Fibonacci number and the n minus first, by first calculating this n minus first integer matrix power. We can do that iteratively, and later we're going to do it more efficiently by repeated squaring. Now in order to analyze that iterative algorithm that calculates a, then a to the square, square then a cubed, um, a to the fourth, and so on, in order to analyze that iterative algorithm, we first uh, observe, count the number of operations and see that a single d times d matrix multiplication, which is more general than the case needed here, two times two, but let's still do that, 
D times D matrix multiplication takes D to the cube operations, right? Row times column. Each row contains D entries. Each column contains D entries. So that's O of D multiplications and additions to obtain one entry in the resulting matrix. But we want all D times D entries in the resulting D times D matrix. So we do that for all D squared entries, each one O of D for row times column, resulting in D cube operations for matrix multiplication. Now we're not just multiplying two matrices, but we're doing that repeatedly k times so that the number of operation here is d cubed times k. The memory use of this algorithm, this algorithm stores the entries of one matrix and then multiplies that to a to get the entries of the next matrix and can then forget the entries of the previous intermediate result. So this algorithm only needs to store d squared entries of the current d times d matrix. That's our analysis of the number of operations and the number of integer variables stored. Now moving on, uh, refining that to a bit cost analysis, we need to trace how large are the integers that arise in this iterative matrix multiplication, this matrix powering. And observe that in general, the entries of a matrix power grow. They can grow, easily grow exponentially already for one times one matrix, which is just a single number. Raising a one times one matrix, an integer like two to the kth power, results into the integer two to the k. So an exponential growth in the value arising in these matrices and therefore a linear growth in the value in the binary length of these entries. Now here we don't have only just a one times one matrix, but a two, a two times two matrix. And more generally, what if we raise d times d matrices to the kth power? To this end, recall that if we square a d times d matrix, then the entries in that matrix not only become larger by a squared, but also become in general multiplied by d. And I want you to um, prove that, to observe why is the factor of d occurring here. Spoiler alert. This is because we here consider the maximum norm. As you may recall from linear algebra, the space of matrices, D times D matrices, can be equipped naturally with various forms, maybe the column sum norm, or the maximum norm, or the spectral norm, or the operator norm, which is important later in infinite dimensional matrices, functional analysis. Here, for the purpose of analyzing this algorithm, but we're interested in the maximal norm, and that's the reason why this factor D occurs for squaring a matrix. Now here we're not only squaring the matrix, we're raising it to the kth power. So let's analyze uh, by induction using that basically as induction state. How does the magnitude of the entries grow when we raise it to the kth power? And the answer to that is uh, the maximum taking to the kth power times d to the k minus one. Now, in order to understand that, let's plug in the special case where k is equal to two, thus recovering the squaring case. When k is equal to two, then d to the k minus one is just d. So we recover this case meaning that this is indeed a generalization of what we already discussed in squaring. On the other hand, it's a simple generalization of that from squaring to multiplying to a matrix, it's a proof of that inequality by induction on K. So I want to 
uh, skip here over the details and leave that to you and just use that. And remember, our goal is not immediately for the magnitude of the entries, but the binary length of the entries. How do we proceed from magnitude value to binary length? By taking the binary logarithm. Binary logarithm is roughly the binary length of an integer. And taking the binary logarithm of both sides here, the right-hand side means the exponent k minus one becomes a factor, and this results in log d. So together we get this estimate that the binary length of the case power entries in the case power is at most k times the logarithm of d plus k times the binary length of the entries in the initial matrix. Now in our particular case, we have d equals two, which is a constant. So that kind of vanishes, is ignored in the asymptotic analysis. And the entries in the initial matrix are just zeros and ones. So that the logarithm of that becomes zero and vanishes at well. So long story short, asymptotically, our counting analysis when k is a constant is a linear number of operations and a constant number of entries to be stored. Of course, D is constant. And proceeding from there to a bit cost analysis, the length of the entries are uh, grow linearly with K, so that, that the number of bits stored is constantly many entries of K bits each. That's O of K. A little bit more involved is the analysis of the bit cost running time, because observe that this algorithm, let me revert back to the algorithm based on the matrix. Um, this algorithm actually involves matrix multiplication, right? And matrix multiplication is composed from integer multiplication and integer addition. So the integers of length k that we have here are not only added, as it was the case for the iterative and the recursive algorithm, but they are also multiplied. Now we talked already about the uh, running time for adding and for copying n-bit integers, which is O of n. But what is the running time of multiplying n-bit integers? What is the memory used for multiplying n-bit integers? And the answer to that is has been actually a long story because the high school method that you learn the so-called long multiplication. The high school method takes n squared operation for multiplying two n-bit integers or k squared operation for multiplying k-bit integers because the high school method writes this first integer, first uh, argument in several rows, in k rows, shifted, right? And then it adds some of these shifted rows, but in general, there are k rows of k bit shifted integers each, so that in general, we have adding k integers of k bit each, which occur incurs a cost of k squared bit operations. Now, this long multiplication, the high school method, is not the most efficient way of multiplying long integers. There are more efficient ways, such as, for example, Karatsuba multiplication, or two multiplication, or Cook multiplication, all of algorithms that we already discussed and analyzed in CS300 introduction to algorithm. For a long time, the most efficient algorithm for multiplying long integers was the strassen schoenhage algorithm, which uh, is based on uh, artificially uh, um, field extensions in order to perform uh, Fourier uh, algorithm. This is far beyond the scope of the current algorithm because it heavily relies on, relies on 
um, algebra field extension, finite field extension. What I'd like to recall here and just report is the world record for long integer multiplication to to Harvey and Joris van der Hoeven from 2019 about fastest integer multiplication. And this algorithm takes n log n um, bit operations for multiplying n bit integers, or in our case, k log k operations for multiplying k bit integers. So that here we need to multiply the uh, O of k counting operations, counting both additions and integer multiplications. Multiply that not with just factor of k, which is the bit cost of integer addition, but multiply it with k log k, which is the bit cost of integer multiplication, to arrive at a bit cost, capital T, of k squared times log times k times log k, which is a little bit slower if you think about it than the iterative algorithm. The memory use increases also by a factor of k because each variable stores k bits. So as I said, this algorithm is actually slower than the iterative algorithm, which is why in CS300, we accelerated that iterative matrix powering algorithm to repeated squaring, not multiplying a, a squared, a cubed, a to the fourth, a to the fifth, but a to the second, a to the fourth, a to the eighth, by repeatedly squaring the previous power, a to the fourth, we immediately get a to the eighth, and thus arrive at a to the k much faster using only log k iteration of that instead of O of k iteration of that. And still based on repeatedly multiplying matrices. Now the counting analysis of this iterative algorithm for matrix powering is log k phases. And in each phase, we perform an ordinary d times d matrix multiplication. So d cubed times log k. And in this algorithm, we need to store uh, still only d squared entries. So this is a typo should be d squared. I mean the previous entry to proceed from a to the fourth to a to the eighth. We only need to know the previous the entries of the previous power and we can forget the entries of the second power and similarly uh, higher up. Now this is um, quite clear in case that we're aiming for uh, exponent k, which is a power of two, like a to the 16, a to the 32, a to the 64, and so on. But what happens if we want to calculate like a to the 31? Superficially, then we need to also store all the previous powers of two. Namely, in order to get a to the 32, we multiply a to the 16 with a to the 8, a to the 4, a to the 2, and a to the 1, because the binary extension of the exponent 31 contains all these bits. It is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. But we do not really need to store all these previous powers. Maybe by proceeding from a to the second, not directly to a to the fourth, but a to the third, multiplying a to squared with a, then squaring a to the third, thus obtaining a to the sixth, not a to the fourth, but a to the sixth, multiply a to the sixth with a again to obtain a to the seven, then squaring a to the seven, to obtain a to the 14th, multiply a to the 14 with a again, get a to the 15, squaring a to the 15 to get a to the 30, multiply a to the 30 with a to get a to the first, uh, uh, 31st. 
So long story short, by adjusting this repeated squaring method, one can make it uh, apply also for exponents which are not integer powers of two and still avoid having to store all the previous powers, still getting away with storing only one previous matrix and it's d to the squared, not d to the q entries. So that's our analysis of this repeated squaring, counting the number of variables and counting the number of integer operations. But again, when we want to proceed to a more accurate um, prediction in the bit cost model, we need to multiply each entry here with O of K for the bit. We need to multiply each operation here, the operations being integer addition and integer multiplication with K times log K. And thus we arrive at the running time analysis of K times log squared bit operations and O of K bit operations, uh, bit storage use. Where now we use that D is equal constant, so we could ignore it in the asymptotic notion. And also observe that now this matrix-based algorithm is finally more efficient than the iterative one. Here, iterative had n squared bit operations. Here had n times log square n, because k is equal to n minus one. So this was our most efficient algorithm in CS300 when we focused on running time efficiency. Now from the perspective of memory efficiency, observe that on the, all the three letter algorithms, which are very different in their so runtime efficiency, all have linear memory use. O of n here, O of k, which is n minus one here, and also O of k here. So from the perspective of memory use, that these three algorithms are all equally good, and they're actually optimal because we already analyzed that the final Fibonacci number has O of n bits according to Binet's formula. So any algorithm will need O of n bits necessarily. That's best optimal to store even already the last final Fibonacci number. So these algorithms cannot be further improved asymptotically in terms of their memory use. That concludes our story. That concludes our examples of analyzing previous algorithms, uh, various algorithms for the same problem for Fibonacci number calculation, now from the perspective of um, memory use. And we apply two types of memory use, two measures of memory use, one counting the number of variables and a more refined one uh, counting the number of bits stored. The first indicated with small s because it is generally smaller and the latter indicated with capital S because it tends to be a little bit larger. Good, so now moving on, uh, let's recall matrix powering as we just did. We just did for the case of integer matrix powering. Now we want to review it for the case of Boolean matrix powering because we're aiming for memory efficient algorithms for graph reachability. And remember, already when we talked about efficient parallel algorithms for graph reachability, these arose from uh, efficient parallel algorithms for Boolean matrix powering because um, the Boolean matrix powers capture the uh, 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 more precisely, adjacency matrix powers capture um, graph reachability quantitatively. The kth power captures whether and which vertices can be read within at most k steps. So let's uh, specify the Boolean matrix problem, powering problem again. We have an n times n Boolean matrix. We want to raise that to the kth power where k is a given argument and a new subtlety here. In this case, we're not interested in the entire resulting n times a matrix, a to the k, 
but we're only interested in one entry, namely the entry with coordinates i, j. Because this entry tells us, this entry being true or false, tells us whether it is possible to reach vertex j from vertex i within k steps. If we calculate the entire matrix a to the k, we will immediately be able to answer all shortest pair query, whether for any given i and any given j, it's possible to reach vertex j from vertex i. This is a all shortest pass uh, problem. But storing the matrix a to the k entirely, n times n matrix, requires n square bits of memory. Since we're aiming for memory efficient algorithm, more precisely aiming for sublinear memory algorithm, we're only interested in one bit, the bit with coordinates i, j. So that raises our hope to be able to solve this problem with sublinear memory, not storing the entire resulting matrix a to the k. And also another twist is we don't count the input matrix A as using memory. We suppose that the input matrix A, which is also an n times n matrix, so it also occupies n squared bits of memory. And we assume that this memory is uh, some other memory that is not considered counting a working memory, some read-only memory that we cannot modify, that we cannot use for algorithm. Or maybe that the, these n square bits can are provided on the fly by some other algorithms so that we don't even store the input matrix A, but we call some algorithm that uh, returns to our algorithm a specific entry in the input matrix A without storing it by calculating it on the fly and by possibly by recalculating it. And this recalculation will turn out to a major, be a major technique for improving the memory efficiency of our algorithms. So we do not count the input n times n matrix towards using working memory. Instead, it's supposed to lie in some uh, other read-only memory that doesn't count. And similarly, we don't output the entire n times n matrix A to the K. Now, before proceeding to algorithms for this uh, variant of the Boolean matrix powering algorithm, let's consider um, the Boolean uh, matrix multiplication problem. Maybe let's suppose we're given two n times n matrices, square matrices x and y, in the same way that their input do not count as working memory. And we're interested in calculating the memory uh, efficient algorithm for calculating the product X and Y, more precisely for calculating any desired entry within coordinates I, J in the resulting product matrix X times Y. So multiplying these two matrices, not returning the entire result, which is an n times n matrix, but returning only one desired bit at coordinates i, j. And recall the formula for this kind of Boolean matrix multiplication, where the sum becomes a disjunction and the product becomes a conjunction. Row times column now means row, row and column taking the disjunction or. And an obvious memory efficient algorithm for doing that, since we don't consider the input matrix to be stored, only needs a counter basically, right? It needs to store i and j. i and j range from one to capital N. So storing i and j uses log n bits of memory each. And we have this loop counter L running from one to n in this huge disjunction. So we need another log n bits in our algorithm to store L 
in binary. Notice that I don't even mention the algorithm because it's also obvious. Just spell out that huge disjunction of n entries into a loop. So to conclude, this subproblem of multiplying two Boolean matrices uses only log n bits of memory, sublinear memory, because of the two subtleties. First, we are not interested in outputting or even storing the entire result matrix, only the entry Boolean 1 and Boolean entry true or false at position i, j. And we're not counting the input matrices such as to use Occupy working memory. They use some other kind of read-only memory. And the interesting thing is that this strange conception of not considering uh, the input matrix as Occupy working memory still results in uh, kind of algorithms that are closed under composition. And I will um, elaborate on that in a minute when we now proceed to the algorithm for Boolean matrix powering based on repeatedly multiplying Boolean matrices, but in this case, not iteratively, but remember we're doing that with a repeated squaring approach. This is again repeated squaring, now stated as a recursive algorithm. It actually is basically the same algorithm that I mentioned before, but now spelled out recursively because that's easier to analyze both in terms of the running time and the memory use. So what you see here is superficially, it's basically mathematics. It's expressing the case power of the matrix A, Boolean matrix A, in the two cases when k is even and k is odd, expressing that recursively as raising a to the k over 2 exponent and then squaring it or raising it to the k minus 1 over 2 power and then squaring it and multiplying it with a. If k is odd, because when k is odd, k over 2 is not an integer, but k minus 1 over 2 is an integer. So in that case, this, this case actually is a well-defined recursive call because this mathematical two expressions with a case uh, distinction immediately uh, result in a recursive algorithm with making actually one recursive call here and here making a recursive call and another multiplication. So here, one recursive call and then multiplying that with itself. Here, making a recursive call, multiplying the result to itself and multiplying it with A. Now we've already analyzed the memory use for each of these two and here three matrix multiplication. So that the memory use of this recursive algorithm for repeated squaring is given in the bit cost model Right. Remember, we're talking about bits here. Anyway, no integers involved. So small s and capital S here coincide and they're equal to the cost for the recursive. We calculate raising a to the k minus second power over second power plus the overhead for performing this multiplication to itself or the overhead for here performing three multiplications, this one and this. And that overhead we already determined here in our previous consideration, which is all log n of this. So by solving this recurrence, what immediately arrives at, right? So the depth of this recurrence, half dividing k by a factor of two and rounding down if it's odd, keeping it if it's not odd, combines both cases to one plus O of log n bits overhead. Recursion depth is log k because we divide k by two in each layer. So that the overall memory use here, the solution to this recurrence is multiply O of log n with O of k, the number of uh, recursive levels, resulting in an algorithm that only stores log k times log n bits of working memory.
which is very memory efficient. First of all. Second observation, this memory use is the same as the parallel runtime of the same problem, of the algorithm for the same problem that we devised and analyzed in chapter nine on parallel algorithms, log k times log n parallel time, which we will see later is no coincidence, but just one more example of a general principle. Also, let me emphasize that this recursive algorithm is very inefficient in terms of running time, unlike the case for the Fibonacci numbers. But then again, for the Fibonacci numbers, we were interested in the entire final Fibonacci number, not just in individual bits of it. Here, we're only interested in individual bits. And what you see here, for example, is when this algorithm um, is part of this recursion, then it uh, makes a recursive call to calculate a to the k over two. And it makes a recursive call to calculate a to the k over two here again, but it's only interested in different, it makes two recursive calls and it discards most of the result because from the first recursive call, it's only interested in the pos bit at position i comma l. And in the second recursive call, it's only interested in the bit at position l comma j. So it doesn't really make sense to combine this into one recursive call because remember, each of these recursive call will only return one bit. Namely, in this case, this bit, and in this case, this bit of the same matrix, namely a to the k over two, to redoing many of the calculations, but saving a lot of memory, namely returning only one bit here and one bit here, instead of storing the entire resulting matrix. And we'll analyze in a few minutes what is the uh, penalty in running time for this uh, memory efficiency for saving memory at the expense of performing many recalculations here. But first, let's apply this memory efficient algorithm to graph reachability and comparing it to, uh, for example, the memory use of Dijkstra's algorithm. So for the record, entry-wise, which we only calculate and return one bit in the resulting Boolean matrix power, entry-wise Boolean matrix powering without storing the input matrix can be done in log k times log n bits of working memory, not counting the input matrix. Now for graph reachability, when we're talking about a graph, directed graph with n vertices, like this one, we want to find out whether it's possible to get from start vertex S input to target vertex T within at most K steps. This can be solved by powering, raising the adjacency matrix of K, graph K, uh, G to the Kth power. And in order to apply our previous paradigm and not storing the Input matrix, this means we're not storing, going to count uh, the memory for storing the input graph. We're only going to access it using these queries. Is there an edge from U to W? Put differently, is the bit in the adjacency matrix at in positions U and W, is that zero or one? Now let's recall the classical algorithm for answering this question. Uh, that's Dijk star maintaining these wave fronts. Right? So Dijk star has these phases where it starts with star vertex S and then determines all vertices that can be reached from S within one step. Then from that proceeding to all vertices that can be reached within two steps and with the three steps and so on, repeatedly walking on to larger and larger um, uh, neighborhoods. And each neighborhood, right, when we try to parallelize that, the limitation was that this has 
up to n or in general up to k phases. Here the limitation is we need to store these neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods can have in general up to of n vertices. So that the memory use for dex star is storing up to n integers in the neighborhood. And each one up to log k plus log n actually bits for the counter of the phases and for storing the vertices. Then how did we proceed to a more efficient parallel algorithm using this matrix powering, right? By the way, on the other end, Dijkstra not only solves the single source, single target reachability problem, but Dijkstra sol solves the single source, all target problem, whereas all problem specification and the key to our memory improvement is only single source, single target. And use this <coughs> entry-wise Boolean matrix powering, we can now conclude that this can also be solved in log n times log k bits. Directed graph reachability, because we're talking about directed graphs represented and stored with Boolean adjacency matrix. When it comes down to undirected graph, so which is a particular case of directed graphs, there, Weingold <laughs> made a breakthrough in 2008 by devising an algorithm that can solve the undirected graph reachability single source, single target problem using only log n bits rather than log n squared. This algorithm is far beyond the purpose of this lecture. I'm not going to uh, present or even analyze it, but uh, report in it. Instead, now I want to talk a little bit about the cost that comes in with memory saving in this way. I already mentioned that our memory efficient algorithm for matrix powering and for directed graph reachability performs a lot of recalculations, forgetting intermediate results in order to save memory, in order to keep only one bit of the intermediate resulting matrix A to the L, let's say. So the general paradigm for memory efficient algorithm is forgetting intermediate results as much as possible and recalculating them on the fly, thus trading uh, running time for memory efficiency. But this trade-off is in general very costly. And let's uh, analyze the cost uh, in terms of memory, lack of memory efficiency with this example of uh, matrix um, uh, uh, squaring or more general matrix powering for graph reachability. So here you see again the formula for matrix squaring. And remember that this is one uh, the primitive of the repeated, repeated squaring approach. So we do that repeatedly. In other words, this uh, x here, this x and also this x are the result of recursive calls. So in order to access that position x i comma l involves making a recursive call and also accessing this involves making a recursive call and although maybe x here is the same as x as here because we're squaring, these are two different recursive calls because we're interested here, our algorithm is interested in different positions of the matrix x. And according to our specification, our algorithm does thus also the recursive calls only return individual positions here and not the entire n times n matrix. So that we now analyze the running time instead of the memory use, we see that here we have two uh, <clears throat> uh, recursive calls and now 
memory can be reused, time cannot. So here we have a plus instead of a maximum. Times O of K, because here <clears throat> we our cantor L is running from one to L using only log N bits to store, but using O of N um, iterations of the loop, each making these recursive calls. Now look at the, this recurrence for the running time. Uh, we have two recursive calls of size K over two. So that here we have uh, uh, basically each time multiplying with N of N and the solution of this recurrence is O of N raised to the kth power times O of K. So this is super polynomial running time. It's running time raised to the logarithm of K. Exponential would be raised to the K. This is better than exponential, but polynomial would be raised to some constant and not to the logarithm of K. So this is an example of the cost of saving memory of the paradigm of forgetting and recalculating intermediate results. All these intermediate uh, recalculations cost time. And in this case, the time grows to super polynomial where the extra needs more memory, but the running time is of course only polynomial. So, that's being said, let's now move on uh, and recall, we have here this algorithm for graph reachability. And I've already mentioned that here we have this coincidence with the amount of bits memory used by this algorithm seems to coincide with the parallel running time of our parallel algorithm for graph reachability. Here, parallel running time means depth, which was the same. Is this a coincidence? No, actually it's not. Because there's a famous theorem by Alan Borodin, University of Toronto from 1977, that says any algorithm whose sequential running time is T of N, which uses S of N, bits of memory at most can be parallelized to a circuit whose depth is S of N. So the memory used here um, translates directly linearly times the logarithm of N uh, of T. So the sequential running time becomes logarithmic in the parallel algorithm. So that means if we have an uh, <clears throat> algorithm with sequential running time T of N using S of N bits memory, that gives rise to an efficient parallel algorithm where the acceleration becomes logarithmic exponential acceleration times the memory use. So the memory is you know, indeed a cr crucial factor here. And the proof of this theorem proceeds by reducing the uh, algorithm problem to a graph reachability problem, which is a well-known technique in the theory of computing. And uh, I will give many more examples in my course CS422 theory of computing, such as, for example, Savage theorem is an example of this reachability method. For now, let's just um, say that one can or observe and record that one can kind of express and store the state of any algorithm with a snapshot of all its memory variables and a snapshot of its program counter. Let me say it again. So if you, on your computer, you uh, press the hibernate button or you uh, execute the hibernating command, what happens is that the whole memory state and the program counter of your computer is stored into external memory, which may take uh, 
seconds, maybe even a minute. And then when you resume the computer from hibernation, it will just resume as if you hadn't even uh, hibernated it before, right? And that technique can be applied to any algorithm. But differently, the snapshots of all memory location and of the program counter gives a complete temporal uh, picture of what the algorithm does. And this snapshot is called a configuration. And now imagine that such a configuration is a node in a large graph. More precisely, any possible configuration gives rise to a node in this graph, the so-called configuration graph. Then in this graph, we have a starting configuration. Let's say one is the starting configuration, which captures that initially all variables are maybe reset to zero, except for maybe one variable which contains the input, the argument, or constantly many variables which contain the constantly many arguments. And then when we make one step of that algorithm, simulate that algorithm as a thought experiment, that algorithm will make a transition to the next configuration, which will look almost like the same, except maybe for one variable that has been changed. Then another transition, <clears throat> another transition and so on. And in the end, maybe that algorithm arrives at the end instruction. And before that, let's just for the sake of convenience, suppose that the algorithm clears all variables before arriving at the final end instruction. This means that their end configuration is unique, right? The end configuration is the one when the graph reaches the end instruction in your program counter. And by supposing without loss of generality that before that the algorithm resets all variables to zero, it means that the end configuration is unique, meaning that in our configuration graph, there's a unique end configuration. So the question <clears throat> whether the algorithm outputs true or false now translates to the question whether the unique initial configuration, there's a path to the unique accepting end configuration corresponding to returning true, or whether there's a path to the unique rejecting end configuration corresponding to the return value to be false. So that means we have here at our hand indeed a graph reachability problem. Now this graph is huge, however, right? Contains one vertex for every possible configuration. And if we have S bits of storage in our algorithm, that means there are two to the S possible snapshots, two to the S possible configuration. So it has so many vertices. On the other hand, we don't need to store, at least we need to, don't need to store the initial, uh, um, well, we don't need to store the entire graph, right? We can always query or answer query, is there an edge from this configuration to this configuration by simulating, by kind of resuming the frozen state corresponding to this given configuration and then simulating one step and check whether this is a resulting configuration without caring all about all the exponentially many other configurations or nodes. And this is exactly what our algorithm for the graph reachability problem uses, right? It doesn't store the entire input graph, but it is able to, or requires the ability to answer, is there an edge from here to here, yes or no? Is there the bit in the corresponding adjacency matrix, is it true or false? Without needing to store the entire exponentially large uh, adjacency matrix. Also the question whether 
the accepting torsion vertex can be reached from the except from the initial vertex is whether it can be reached within how many how many steps? Well, we're talking about algorithm with T of n running time. So we're asking whether it's possible to reach the torsion vertex within T of n steps. So our capital K here in the reachability problem is T and our n, the number of vertices in the reachability problem is two to the O of S of n. So applying what we devised and analyzed about memory efficient graph reachability is this amount of memory, but applying our efficient parallel algorithm is a, a parallel algorithm whose depth is the logarithm of n, the logarithm of two to the O of S of n is O of S of n times log k, that's the logarithm of t. Uh, t. So that our algorithm, per efficient parallel algorithm from chapter nine about um, efficient parallel graph reachability gives rise to um, efficient parallel simulation of any algorithm with sequential running time t of n and memory use s of n. So the memory use basically determines whether an algorithm can be efficiently parallelized or not. Now there's a counterpart to this theorem of Borodin, but I will not go into this uh, today because we're already uh, reaching the end of time. So to summarize, we've uh, analyzed uh, several algorithms for calculating Fibonacci numbers, not only with respect to their running time, but also with respect to their memory use. We've analyzed them first counting the number of operations, then uh, and the number of uh, variables stored, and then more refinedly counting the number of bit operations and counting the number of bits of memory they store. Then we've recalled uh, memory efficient algorithms. Uh, we've analyzed algorithms for repeated squaring, squaring Boolean matrices with respect to their memory use we've applied that to memory efficient algorithm for the graph reachability problem for directed graph reachability. This is still the world record for directed graph reachability for undirected graph reachability, the world record and uh, it will never be beaten is log of n for undirected graph reachability by uh, Goldreich. And we've uh, then recalled the general technique due to Alan Borodin for turning memory efficient algorithms into parallel algorithms based on reformulating uh, algorithm simulation as a graph reachability problem, a directed graph reachability. Next time, we will look into uh, streaming algorithms and also into memory uh, uh, hierarchy algorithms, IO efficient algorithms. But for today, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention and tune in back next time. Goodbye.